Hello, this is part two of my DFAM deep dive series. In this video, we'll take a look at the noise generator, external input, and envelopes on the DFAM. I'm going to do some serious geeking out and then use what we've learned to create three patches. Like I said, we're going to geek out and go into a lot of detail. A good friend of mine calls it cork sniffing. Anyway, I get asked a lot of the time how I've learned all this stuff. Mainly it's from years of experience, reading and experimenting, and of course, cork sniffing, geeking out, and going into the minutia is a big part of that. Understanding why certain things behave the way they do helps me make musical decisions quickly. A lot of the stuff covered in this video, envelope length or shapes or noise frequencies, for instance, are probably things that you've noticed uh, by simply listening and using your ears. For some reason in music, there's always been arguments about the usefulness of theory. Uh, some people believe it's best not to learn theory and learn everything by ear. Others embrace theory and sometimes go a bit far with it to justify odd musical decisions. But in my opinion, theory is the best way to teach your ears what something sounds like. I wish my ears had brains in them, then maybe I wouldn't need to learn all this stuff, but they don't. So I like to think of theory and geeking out as a way to teach my ears what something sounds like. In music, and especially in synthesized music, the beauty is found a lot of the time in subtlety. I've found that teaching my ears to hear that has really helped. Then when composing or performing, I can make musical decisions based on what I'm hearing as well as what I know. So we'll spend a while on noise generators and noise comparisons and probably over 15 minutes on envelope generators. I'll do a comparison of the Moog Studio envelopes, DFAM Mother 32 and Subharmonicon. So that'll be useful for people with a Mother 32 or Subharmonicon who want to have a clear idea of the differences between these synths and hopefully will make cross patching easier and more informed. So this video is really for those who are in the mood for a serious synth geek out. So if you're not in that headspace, maybe you'll want to return to this when and if you are. Okay, anyway, I'll put an index and link to patch diagrams in the description. And before we get to work, here's a quick demo of the patches we'll be working on after all the theory. Okay, we're going to pick up where we left off in the last video and start by looking at the noise generator on the DFAM. Problem is, there's no noise direct out. Even if the VCA decay is long, it's still not long enough for a good examination, so I'm going to patch a DC offset into the VCA CV input to hold the VCA open so we can hear it. Oh, and I'm going to use FabFilter Q3 as a spectrum analyzer. It's really not the best for this, but it's the best I have and good enough for our purposes. Okay, I'll patch in that DC offset and we'll get going. This is just like holding a door open. Looking at the spectrum analyzer, we can see that it's clearly not equal across all frequencies, so not truly white noise. So I'm going to compare it with the tone generator, just going to use the standard plugin included with my DAW. It's good enough, we'll set it to white noise. So you can see the white noise from the tone generator is what we'd expect. It's equal across all frequencies. Let's compare it with the DFAM. Okay, let's compare them visually. Pure white noise is in the background there. 
you can clearly see that the DFAMS generator has much more activity in the mids. Uh, it seems to be a roll off at the top and bottom frequencies, very apparent compared to the tone generator from the DAW. But we're comparing the output of the DFAM with the plugin after the filter in the VCA in the DFAMS audio path. So it's possible that although the filter is wide open, that it's still affecting the sound. So let's patch the noise generator from the DAW, which we know is white noise, into the external input on the DFAM and see if we get similar results. All right, there's our answer. The filter, even though it's wide open, is definitely affecting our output. There's definitely less highs and lows, but the DFAM still has more mids. Let's bring in that um, sidechain comparison again. So we're seeing the plug-in pre and post DFAM. The output is lower, but we can still see the roll off. And there's the DFAM, higher output, more mids, steeper roll off. Now the differences could just be due to volume matching or the accuracy of this scope. Although I do hear a clear difference between the plug-in noise generator and the DFAM's noise generator. And that's the important thing, that we hear a difference. I'm guessing Moog went with the skewed white noise because it's more versatile. For instance, it'll be easier to get a convincing snare sound with more activity around 600 hertz to 1 kilohertz, and there's still enough highs to get a nice hi-hat sound. Okay, I said we'd be cork sniffing, and I've got a Mother 32 right here. Now I'm curious to see how the noise generator on the Mother 32 compares to the DFAM. Mother 32 is a direct output for noise, so if we patch directly out, it shouldn't be affected by the filter or the VCA. Huh, looks very similar to the DFAM. You can see filter's not affecting it. Well, that's interesting. Let's patch directly out of the VCA. Now the filter will affect the sound and the VCA as well. Let's uh, compare those. Oops. I already forgot what it sounded like. Okay, that was post filter. And direct. Back. Okay, although it's not super visible on the scope, you can clearly hear that there's more highs from the direct out. So if the filter is wide open, it's still affecting the sound. That's conclusive now. And I assume it's the same with the DFAM. So something to keep in mind while sound designing. I think this also shows that the noise outputs on the Moog Studio instruments, while well, at least the Mother 32 and the DFAM, are not truly white noise. So let's see if we can figure out what it actually is. To help us do that, I'm going to use this cool little noise generator from Siren FX called Noise Palette. It's an awesome little plugin and it's donationware. This knob here controls the type of noise. You can go from white, and you can see their white has a roll off at around 50 hertz. But we can go all the way up to violet and all the way down to red and everything in between. Cool. I've used this plugin so much as the sound source for countless patches. Thank you, Siren FX. Comparing the DFAMS out with the white noise from the Siren FX, you can see the roll off in the lows is about the same. We just got to deal with the highs. There's a little roll off dial right on the plugin. The slope doesn't seem to be the exact same. Let's try just monkeying with the noise type and see just how close we can get it. That's pretty close. Bit of the lows off. I think we got it. Or at least as close as I can get for now. You may be asking, why does this matter? Well, I told you we'd be getting into some nerdy things, but uh, for me, this is important because now I know what to expect from the noise output on the DFAM. It'll help me dial sounds in faster, or if I'm not getting the sound I want, I will know why and what tool or instrument to use to get the sound I do want. Okay, but I think that's probably enough geeking out with noise for now. Guessing I've lost at least three quarters of my viewers by now. For those of you still here, let's move on and take a closer look at the DFAM's envelope generators. Alright, last video I went into some detail about the VCO envelope generator. Uh, get ready for some serious geeking out. We're going to go into a lot of detail and check out the behavior of the DFAM's envelope generators in detail. And I'm going to compare them with other members of the Moog Studio, the uh, Mother 32 and Subharmonicon. 
going to start with uh, all three of the DFAM's envelope generators patched directly out into my scope. The VCA EG is on top, the filter EG in the middle, and the VCO EG on the bottom. The VCA envelope generator is set to fast. Remember, it's the only of the three envelope generators on the DFAM that has any parameter for attack time. The decay on all the envelope generators is set to zero. And it appears the VCF decay time is slightly longer than the other two. That could just be my scope. Okay, I'm gonna bring up the VCA decay time. Let's look at the envelope shape. Looks like an exponential decay. That's a pretty common envelope shape. If the decay time is longer than the time between the triggers, you can see that the VCA is held open. CV doesn't have time to return to zero. The result is the note rings through, and if we increase even more, there's very little volume change between triggers. Cool. Okay, let's bring that decay time back down. And bring up the tempo. Oh, I'm gonna go off on a little tangent here. Um, I'm sure you know this. This is in the Moog manual in a lot of their videos you can bring the sequencer to audio rate. So you can use the sequencer as an oscillator if you want. Might do a patch with that later on. Okay, back to envelope generators. Okay, I'm gonna turn the sequencer down to its slowest tempo and see if the envelope generator's decay is long. Well, yeah, it is. It's long enough to hold open easily between triggers, even at the slowest tempo. So that's great. Pretty versatile decay time. Okay, so let's compare these other um, envelope generators. Uh, we'll start with the filter. So I'm going to bring the filter down to about halfway point just so we can hear any filter modulation. And of course, the VCF EG amount controls the amount of modulation. And let's slowly bring it up. Okay, also an exponential decay. And just like the um, VCA, we can hold it open if we want. Remember, at this point, we're not actually modulating the filter. It's the same thing as having the filter wide open. Oh, I guess there's a tiny bit if we put it all the way at zero. So remember that. If you're not hearing the modulation you want, it could be because you've just gone to extremes. And with the longer decay time, I think that shape difference between the VCA decay and the filter decay is more apparent now. Interesting. Okay, let's check out the VCO envelope generator. Yep, it's behaving just the same as the um, filter and envelope generator. No surprises there. In the last video, I went into a lot of detail about the VCO envelope generator, so you might want to check that out if you've got questions. Okay, let's check out the attack time. Just switched it to slow attack on the VCA envelope generator. And it looks like we have a shark fin envelope or um, logarithmic exponential. Also very common. One of my favorite tricks to create softer percussive sounds with the DFAM is to use slow attack on the VCA to dull the initial transient, but to still have a lot of filter modulation to keep a little snap in the sound. I'll do a quick demonstration and then a real patch later on. And we can add some ring by increasing the decay time. Cool. All we need is a little VCO modulation. Want this to be really short. Nice. And if we turn up the VCA decay even more, kind of sounds like a 808 or stomp box uh, bass sound. Okay, that's pretty cool. Can experiment with that a little bit more later on, but uh, let's dial in a just more traditional kick sound. Actually, instead, I'm just going to get rid of all the filter modulation and put it back into a fast attack mode. There we go. Okay, um, we're going to take a look at how the um, velocity sequencer affects the envelope generators. This is a big part of the Moog DFAM sound. So I'm just dialing in different uh, levels randomly there. And you can hear it, but you can also see it on the scope that the um, velocity sequencer is definitely affecting the amplitude of the envelope generators. If it didn't, what would be the point? Now remember, if the VCA decay time is too long, it's ringing through and you might not hear some of the quieter notes. So let's turn that down so you can hear it. There we go, much cleaner now. And one thing to remember, the velocity also affects the filter envelope generator and the uh, VCO envelope generator as well. 
Cool. Oh, there's one thing I forgot. The filter and the VCO envelope generators both have negative amounts on the knobs. Let's take a look at the filter envelope generator. There's positive filter modulation, bright to dark, but we can also go dark to bright. But if you look on the scope, nothing has changed. Let's take a quick look at uh, envelope modulation. Envelope generators are unipolar. In simple terms, that means they generate only positive voltage changes. If we patch the CV out of an envelope generator to the CV in of filter cutoff, for instance, the filter's frequency would be modulated by the full amount of the envelope generator's output. Sometimes that's what we want, but most of the time we don't want the filter to be opened up all the way, we just want a little bit of modulation. So most synths have some sort of attenuator built in. On the DFAM, that's the VCF EG amount knob. If the knob is fully clockwise, then the filter is modulated by the full amount of the envelope generator's output. It's just like directly patching into the filter cutoff. But as we turn the knob counterclockwise back to the center, then the output of the envelope generator is attenuated. When we get to the center position on the VCF EG amount knob, the signal is fully attenuated. It's like turning off a tap. There's no CV getting through. The filter cutoff is then determined by the position of the cutoff knob alone. Here's the important part. The VCF EG amount is actually an attenuverter. Attenuverter is a modular term for something that attenuates as well as inverts control voltage. So if we turn the VCF EG amount knob counterclockwise, it inverts the CV from the envelope generator as well as attenuates it. So by the time we're fully counterclockwise, we get a full negative mirror image of the CV generated by the envelope generator. The main reason I wanted to clear that up is because the output of any of the envelope generators on the DFAM will always be positive. You just saw that on the scope. So remember when patching, if you take the output of the VCA EG, VCF EG, or VCO EG from the patch bay, it will always be positive or unipolar. That's why I have this little CV mixer right beside my DFAM. It's a three channel mixer that can attenuate, offset, and invert CV. I found it to be the most valuable little companion for my DFAM. The Mother 32 has a mixer, but not an inverter or attenuverter. The attenuators on the Matriarch, by the way, are all attenuverters. So if you have a Matriarch, maybe you don't need an extra module. Okay, let's see this in action. The filter envelope is the top trace on the scope, and we'll start with some positive modulation. Okay, everything's working as expected. We're going bright to dark. Let's flip it. So now we're going dark to bright, but as you see, the CV has not changed. I'll raise the cutoff so you can hear that a bit clearer. It's actually easier to hear with pitch, so let's do the same thing with the VCO. There's our positive modulation. Here it's swooping down. Now if I flip it, it will swoop up. Again, no change in the CV. If the envelope CV out was after the VCO EG amount knob, or the attenuverter, we would see a change. The envelope would be inverted. But it's not, so like I said, we'll always have a unipolar signal from any of the envelope outs. Okay, moving on, and time to get even more geeky. I'm going to compare the envelope generators on all the Moog Studio synths. DFAM VCA EG is the top trace on the scope. Mother 32 VCA EG is the middle and subharmonicon VCA EG out is the bottom trace. So again, reason I'm comparing these is so that I have a better understanding of each synth and what they're capable of. It'll help me put patches together faster in the future and hopefully also give me some new ideas for patches. I've got the three synths tuned to a C major triad. Can't hear it now because the notes are all too short, but the DFAM is tuned to a C, Mother 32 is playing an E, and the subharmonicon has the fifth, the G. Okay, as you can see, with the VCA decay at zero, all the synths are pretty much the same. DFAM might be slightly slower, but uh, all are so short, they're basically just outputting a click, which could be used as a trigger signal, by the way. Okay, to start, I'll turn the VCA decay up to nine o'clock on all the synths. I'm just curious to see how they compare if they're all set to the same value. All right, subharmonicon and mother are quite a bit longer than the DFAM, and that makes sense, of course. The DFAM is a percussive synth, so we'd want a faster envelope with more precision at faster decay times. 
To match the decay of the other two synths, we've got to turn the decay time up to around 11 o'clock on the DFAM, which again means that it's way more precise with shorter decays. If the knob was too sensitive, it would be hard to dial in percussive sounds. And conversely, it would be a bit of a pain if you had to turn the decay time up to 11 o'clock on the Mother 32 or Subharmonicon, which are both primarily melodic instruments, if you wanted a note long enough to clearly hear the pitch. Okay, now I'm going to try to set the decay time on all the synths to end just before the next trigger. So DFAM is now around 1 o'clock. Looks like the Mother 32 is about the same position as the DFAM. So DFAM's not going to be as precise with mid to long um, envelope decay times. But subharmonicon is way back at 11. So for mid-length notes, it appears the subharmonicon has the most precision. Subharmonicon's decay slope is also more linear compared to the other two. It's still exponential, but you can hear it ring out a bit longer than the others. So let's check out attack times. I've already flipped the uh, DFAM into slow attack mode. Only have the two attack times on the DFAM. But uh, both Mother 32 and Subharmonicon have variable attack times. Let's see if we can match them. So the Mother 32 is at around nine, but the Subharmonicon is much lower. So the Subharmonicon is much more sensitive with attack times. You can also see that the slope of the envelopes is very different. I did a video about the Subharmonicon envelopes and in it I talked about the linear exponential shape of the Subharmonicon envelope generators. But I already did a video about that, so if you're interested, check that out. The linear attack of the Subharmonicon is really apparent with uh, longer attack times. But let's see how these stack up if we use a gate instead of a trigger. Up until now the DFAM has been the clock source and the DFAM outputs a trigger, not a gate. So I'm going to switch things around and have the mother act as the clock. I'll mult the gate out of the mother and send it to the trigger inputs of the DFAM and subharmonicon. The subharmonicon has a trigger input, not a gate. But as you'll see, it responds to gate signals. So there it is. Mother 32 is outputting a gate, but it's not responding to the sustain because we have it set as an AD envelope. If I switched on sustain, then we'd have an AHR envelope, which I'll do in a second. But first, let's look at gate versus trigger signals to explain the subharmonicon's behavior. Trigger versus gate. This is easy to understand. A trigger is a very short pulse wave, and the name really explains it all. It's used to trigger something, usually an envelope. There's no need for a wide pulse because triggers are usually used to trigger AD envelopes or modules or events with no hold or sustain. They're perfect for percussive sounds which generally don't have a sustained tone. And from a functional standpoint, gate length won't get in the way of trigger behavior, which you may have had problems with if you've messed around with the gate length on the Mother 32, for instance. A gate signal is a pulse wave with a wider pulse width. The sustainer pulse width is determined by what is generating the signal. It could be an oscillator or a clock, which may or not have variable pulse width, or it could be a keyboard, which determines pulse width by the length of time a key is depressed. So, why is the subharmonicon responding to the gate length from the Mother 32 even though it has a trigger input and only has controls for attack and decay? Well, turns out the subharmonicon envelopes are AHR envelopes, attack, hold, release. The hold or sustain time is dependent on the gate length. Here's a sticky point. I prefer to think of the envelopes on both the subharmonicon and Mother 32 as attack, hold, release envelopes, not attack, sustain, release envelopes mainly because the ASR envelopes I've dealt with have control over sustain level. Neither of these do. But sometimes the hold time in AHR envelopes is a fixed or programmable amount of time and does not respond to gate length. So there could be an argument for either terminology. But it's my video, so I'm going with AHR. And I'm not even going to go into the release decay argument. All right, as mentioned, the Mother 32's envelopes can be an AD or AHR envelope. Let's flip the sustain switch, and if all goes well, the Mother 32 and subharmonicon envelope should be pretty much identical. Success. 
Okay, the whole reason I went off on that tangent was because I wanted to compare attack times and I thought it would be easier to see if we had an AHR envelope. Let's get the DFAM back in there. And you can see that it's a logarithmic exponential envelope. And let's get the mother 32 in here. It's also a logarithmic attack. But you can see its slope is much more gentle. Try to get a shark fin. There we go. Okay, now let's get the subharmonicon going. And there's our linear attack. So as you can see and hear, the envelopes on all three of these synths are very different. And the subharmonicon has another trick up its sleeve, its re-trigger behavior. It can ignore incoming trigger signals. I go into that in that video I talked about earlier, so I'm not going to do it now. But there, I'm demonstrating it for you anyway. Okay, so again, the envelope generators on all three synths are very different. If they weren't, it would be a real drag. It would be hard to get the sounds you'd expect from each of them if they were all the same. And most importantly, it greatly expands the capabilities of these synths when combined with excellent cross-patching possibilities. Since I've got them all going, I might as well demonstrate a super simple basis for a patch. Phasing oscillators using different envelope times. When I say it like that, it sounds complicated, but all I'm going to do is set the envelope times to different values and generate a dynamic patch with oscillators sounding at different times from a single clock source. I actually really like this idea. I think I'll make a more interesting version of this patch later in the video, but for now, we've gone as far as we need to with our envelope geek out. Okay, gonna start by patching in a DC offset to the VCA so we can hear what's going on. There's our noise, and there's oscillator 2. Pitch doesn't matter at the moment. Noise is gonna be our sound source for this patch, but we're gonna use oscillator 2 to modulate the level. So we're gonna get some amplitude modulation going on. So oscillator 2 is the one modulating the noise, so let's mess around with the pitch a bit. So you can see as we get to around the center position, we're in audio range and we just get a, a distorted noise type sound and counterclockwise, it's acting more like an LFO. Cool. I'm going to stick around the center position on oscillator two and bring the cutoff down a little bit just to get rid of some of those highs and we can exaggerate them a little bit with some resonance. Want to exaggerate that sort of air conditioner hum noise. Now I'm going to clock the matriarch with oscillator 1. I did this in a patch in the last video. And I'm going to sync oscillator 2 to oscillator 1. And we don't need the DC offset. So this setup so far is just like the ratchet patch I did in the uh, last video I posted. So oscillator 1 is clocking the sequencer. We'll keep it at a slow speed for now. Actually, let's patch that DC offset back in without the sequencer running so we can hear the divisions. So the sequencer is controlling the pitch of oscillator 2, which is modulating the noise level. So at the center position and higher, we get more of that staticky sort of noisy sound. And at lower pitches, it's acting like an LFO and we're getting clock divisions. Okay, we don't need that DC offset around the sequencer. And I'll just adjust the individual steps until I find um, a groove I like. 
I've got oscillator 2 set to triangle wave instead of uh, square wave. With square wave we'd get cleaner divisions, but the triangle wave I think sounds more like a human. That's why I call this a, a beatbox patch. It does kind of sound like somebody's buzzing their lips. Now the whole secret to this patch is the VCF mod knob. With nothing patched into the VCF mod input, noise is internally routed. And you can hear that because we're modulating the noise level already with an LFO or the oscillator, some of that oscillator's coming through to modulate the filter. Cool. And now that buzzy lip sound is really clear. So again, with higher pitch values on the sequencer, we're going to hear clearer pitches. There'll be higher pitches, but there'll be clearer pitches. Yeah, and the higher pitches definitely sound even more like somebody spitting the pitch. Cool. Just add a little bit of VCF envelope modulation to um, bring that spit sound a little bit more forward. Cool. And I'll just adjust the velocity sequencer to try to find some dynamics I think sound good. We're getting there. Okay, um, let's open up the VCA a tiny bit. And I think I'm going to lower the pitch of oscillator 2. That's cool. With oscillator 2 at a slightly lower pitch, step 7, 8, which are set to uh, maximum pitch modulation, or the max, and we're getting a clave type sound. Cool. And just making small adjustments to the cutoff, the VCA, and the filter envelope amount, just to dial in a more beatboxy sound. Okay, I think I like that. Maybe I'll just monkey around a tiny bit more. Just experiment and see if I can get it even nicer. Small moves are probably best. Maybe a little faster. Yeah, a little lower. Okay, let's add in some VCO modulation of oscillator 2. Definitely more percussive, more spitty sounding. Great. I actually really like the faster tempo on this, but I'm going to keep it slow so we can really hear what's going on. And again, more VCA decay. Nice. Okay, that's pretty much the patch. You can just experiment until you find something you like. But I've got one more idea. So I think I'm going to modulate the um, VCA decay time. And I'm going to have to attenuate it, so I'm going to use this Splix, a passive attenuator. Get asked about these all the time. I just bought them online from Board Brain Music. It's just an inline attenuator. So I'm patching velocity into VCA decay time, and I'm going to slowly dial in a little bit at a time. Okay, that's obviously too much, but it sounds kind of cool. That's good there. And we'll try a bit more VCO modulation, uh, envelope modulation. And uh, let me show you what it sounds like without our filter modulation. That could be something fun to play with in a performance situation for sure. But it sounds way better with the filter modulation. Okay, let's take a closer look at the uh, pitch sequencer behavior. We'll just look at step six, for instance. If it's around 9 o'clock, it's acting like an LFO and you can hear a bit of a ratchet. But as we turn the pitch up, oscillator 2's frequency is moving closer and closer to audio range and we're going to hear more pitch coming through. So at around 11 o'clock, it sounds more like a kick or a sub bass. And now we're getting a lot of the pitch coming through. If we go all the way up, we're going to get a distorted noise sound. And around 3, it's going to be like Toms. Let's get the ratchet back. Cool, that sounds good. 
Okay, uh, that pretty much does it. I'm just going to mess around for a little bit and experiment. And then we'll move on to our next patch. this patch it's a lot of fun i'm gonna add in some spring reverb just for some finishing touches and that'll do it all right patch number two going to experiment with noise as the sound source and try using external noise as well uh, I've already got a basic patch set up. Like I said, noise is going to be the primary sound source for this patch. It's up about halfway in the mixer. I've got the filter in low pass mode and the cutoff is set to around 11 o'clock. There's no resonance on the filter. VCF decay is also around 10 o'clock to start and a lot of filter envelope modulation, so around 3 o'clock. VCA decay is around the midpoint. Oscillators 1 and 2 are roughly tuned in octaves. Oscillator 1 is a pulse wave and oscillator 2 is set to triangle. There's a lot of VCO envelope modulation on oscillator 1, around 3 o'clock again, but just a tiny little bit of VCO modulation on oscillator 2. I'll play that in a second so you hear how little there is. Hard sync and FM are both off, and the VCO envelope decay is around 9 o'clock. I've got a little sequence programmed in. I think it's just what I left off with with the last patch, but uh, we'll start there. Okay, let's start by hearing the sequence with the way things are set. Okay, that's a good starting point. I'll turn up oscillator 2 so you can hear the tiny little bit of VCO envelope modulation. And let's hear what our pitch sequence sounds like. Weird, but lovely. Okay, I'll put things back the way they were when we started. And I'm going to use oscillator 2 to modulate the filter on this patch. So patch oscillator 2 out in the VCO mod input. And let's bring in the modulation with the VCF knob. Just a lovely grimy metallic sound. And let's assign the sequencer to modulate the pitch of oscillator 2. Cool. Okay, let's use the uh, pitch sequencer to modulate the noise volume amount. So patch pitch out to noise level input. Cool, and that makes a big difference. I'm going to go into much greater detail about the sequencers in the next video, but it's pretty obvious what's going on. If the sequencer step is high, like steps 3 and 8, for instance, the noise is going to be louder. But don't forget that the sequencer is also modulating the pitch of oscillator 2, which is modulating the filter. So we can get some cool sounds just experimenting with step 8 here. That sounds cool. Fully counterclockwise, it will essentially mute the step. I like it best around 1 o'clock. But we just did a patch with the DFEMS noise generators, the sound source, so let's try using an external noise generator. I'm going to use that plugin I mentioned earlier, the Noise Palette by Siren FX. So I already talked about this plugin, but we know we can generate a whole bunch of different colors of noise, starting with white, sort of like the DFAM, and all the way down to red, which is low frequency noise and up to violet, which is high frequency noise. A lot of times when I'm building patches on the DFAM, I find there's too much low mids in the noise to get a clean hot sound. It sort of gets too muddy. So I'm gonna use a brighter sounding noise, something near blue, to uh, make a cleaner sounding patch this time. So I'm just gonna patch directly out of my interface into the DFAM's external input. And now we've replaced the DFAM's noise generator with this uh, plugin.
Now, if I was only going to use noise as a sound source, I think I'd probably stick with a darker sounding noise. But like I said, the plan is to get a cleaner sort of hi-hat or snappy snare sound. So I'm going to stick with blue or pretty close to blue noise. Okay, that's pretty good. And um, let's just add in oscillator one. Yeah, that's nice and clean. Now I'll show you what I mean. If I turn the uh, plug-in down to pink noise, which is closest to the uh, DFAMS noise generator, you can hear how muddy it gets. So blue noise, or maybe even violet, is good for a nice snappy hi-hat. And now we still have the filter to modulate the actual oscillator if we want. Cool, that's a pretty simple, nice sounding patch. Now just for comparison, I'm gonna pull the um, external noise out so we can compare it to what the DFM would actually sound like. And it sounds great, it's very unique sound, but um, if you want a cleaner hi-hat or snare, just try using an external noise source. Okay, that little plugin was great for a nice clean sound, but let's try something totally different. I saw an interview a while back with Alessandro Cortini and Tony Rolando, the founder of Make Noise Modules. They were talking about developing a noise generator based on one of Alessandro's favorite old pieces of gear. Turns out that it was actually broken and picking up radio frequencies. So I thought, why not just use a radio as a noise generator, scanning between frequencies to pick up different hums and sounds. So I'm just going to record some radio into my DAW and we'll use that as our sound source and see what happens. So I've got some good hums recorded, but I'm really curious to see what's going to happen if we use this station just a little bit out of focus. Oh, this is cool. Can't wait to hear what this is going to sound like. All right, so the setup is the exact same as the last patch, except now instead of using the noise palette, I'm just going to play some of the sampled radio into the DFAM and see what happens. I could just plug the radio straight into the DFAM, of course, but using a DAW, I can loop sections I think might sound good. So I'm looping a section that was just static and noise, and you can hear that it's got quite a different sound. It's pretty cool. Let's just let it play and check out some other sections of the um, recording. Skip down to the end, actually. That's pretty cool. But uh, let's start with that staticky section. And let's bring back in the uh, oscillator 2, modulating the filter. And let's bring back in oscillator 1. Nice, that's really cool. Okay, let's try some different noise sources. Let's see what happens over here. Oh yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, that's neat. That could be worth looping. Okay, let's try that very end part where the station was almost playing music. OK, 
Okay, that's pretty much it for this patch. Uh, you can get some pretty great interesting sounds using noise as a sound source on the DFAM, but with the external input, trying out different types of noise is a great way to expand the DFAM even further. You can of course use an oscillator from another synth in the external input. I think I did that in the last video, but I find exploring noise can really be rewarding. Okay, just gonna jam out with this patch for a little bit before we do our final patch of the video. Alright, this last patch is a souped up version of the patch I talked about earlier when talking about the different envelopes on the DFAM, Subharmonicon, and Mother32. I think I called it phasing envelope generators, I can't remember. Anyway, it's basically the same thing. Mother32's gate out is malted and triggering both the DFAM and Subharmonicon. But I'm using the assign out of the Mother32 to clock the sequencers on the Subharmonicon. Uh, the assign out is set to quarter note pulse. Then the subharmonicon sequencer 2 out is advancing the DFAM sequencer. I've set all the generators on all three synths to different attack and decay times, but they are all receiving the same trigger as mentioned. Because they all have different envelope shapes, times, and especially with the subharmonicon behaviors, they're going to sound as if they're all coming in at different times, phasing in and out. The DFAM's two oscillators are tuned in octaves, but only oscillator 1 is being affected by the pitch sequencer. Oscillator 1 is a drone. The Mother 32 is tuned a fifth above the DFAM. The subharmonicon is in tune with the DFAM, but the sequencer is tuned to different notes of a major triad. I'm using a lot of filter modulation to help the phasing effect. The Mother's Triangle LFO is modulating the Mother's filter. The DFAM's velocity out is being attenuated by the Mother 32's mixer and is modulating the rate of that LFO. I'm using the pitch out of the DFAM sequencer to modulate the subharmonicon's filter. Lastly, I'm using a ton of reverb. I'm using Soundtoy's super plate with a very long decay time. Honestly, it's doing as much for this patch as the envelope generators themselves. A good reverb can go a long way. And that's about it. It's a real simple patch that sounds a lot more complicated than it really is. So before I play it for you, I'll just say thanks for watching and I uh, hope you learned something new. I'll continue this series on the DFAM with one more video in a few weeks. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.